Good morning. Good morning, family. Happy Sunday. I hope all of you rested well. Um, to my sisters that ask um, what book um, I was sharing the various Hebrew names of God and also the Hebrew and English names, it is, I commented, I responded back to you guys, but I'll show you here. Um, those were the entire pages I was sharing, but they are in the Sefer. My writing on the Bible is kind of, this thing is fading out a little bit. My Bible getting old. Um, but they're in the beginning of the Sefer. And if you want a copy of the Sefer, you can order one from Sefer.net. Or I, I think some people have said they've gotten a copy from Amazon. It has the books that were deleted. It has the book of Jasher in here. And so these are just tables at the beginning of the book that I was just reading over in the midnight last night. Right? And um, I want to share with you guys. Just wanted to come on and share that. And then I also want to share with you guys um, my reading for this morning. This is what was on my spirit this morning. Oh, excuse me. Um, you that have your Bibles, if you want to turn over to um, Corinthian Rashan, which is First Corinthians, right? I'll read my reading this morning. That's what was in my spirit. This morning, stay in love. Stay in love. And I believe our personal relationship with God, not what we display to people, like not not what we how we present ourselves, because sometimes um, you know, people can present themselves in a way that they want you to perceive them. Rather than just being their raw, um, unedited, authentic version of themselves, you know. Um, and so I believe that our personal relationship with God behind closed doors, um, it re the energy we walk in, right? The spirit that we walk in, uh, that's what people pick up on. That's what's revealed, right? And either you're going to be loved, embraced, or you're going to be hated, <laughs> Right. Um, and so I just believe that's what's that's what's revealed through our actions, you know, how we live out in this earth, you know, the peace and the joy of the Lord obviously resides with those who um walk uprightly and, and sincerely with God. You have we have his joy and that's actually where our strength comes from. That's what strengthens us. And we also abide in love, even if we get out of character, come out of pocket sometimes, even if we, you know, have a, 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 a argument or disagreement with somebody, or if we're fighting for justice and we have to call out a thing that's wrong or, or point out something for injustice that has been done at the end of the day, um, we're not trying to, how can I say this? We're not trying to, um, to, to, to hurt or destroy anybody we want to, sometimes you have to call out a certain thing and in order for um, it to be acknowledged and recognized or to bring it to the forefront, you know, and it's not that you want to destroy someone, but we all sometimes have to take accountability um, for certain things that we may have done to others, right? Um, others who may not be able to stand up and fight for themselves or who don't have a platform to fight for themselves. But um, I think love is the number one thing which connects us and shows that we are connected to the Father. Because in the last days, we know that it is written, in the last days, man's love, people's love will wax cold. And we see that happening now. And just because somebody is walking around, preaching the gospel in a building, on a stage, has hundreds of people following them, or, or tuning into them, um, that doesn't always signify that the presence of God is in that vessel, right? There are certain actions and there are certain things 
the way we live our lives and what we consistently do on a on, on a consistent basis um, how we handle our brothers and sisters those things reveal who our father is and where we are in Christ and if we are walking in purity or not because um you know like i said it's written in the last days you know love will wax cold people will be lovers of themselves seekers of themselves self seeking and we see that and it is unfortunate that we see that in what is uh called at times the body of Christ right And so what was in my spirit this morning, this was in my spirit, stay in love. And I always want to be in that place. I don't, I always want to be in that place. I always want the peace of God. I don't think I can make it in this world. I don't think I can have my sound mind if I didn't have the joy and the peace of the Lord inside of my soul. Nothing external can bring me those things. Like, you know, as we live upright with God, he will make your life prosperous. We will prosper. Our business will prosper. Our investments will prosper. The things we put our hands to, it will prosper. You know, I believe that comes from part of being obedient. And, you know, the devil can give blessings too, but (laughs) he comes back to collect on his blessings, right? And the gift of God, they add no sorrow, right? And so walking with God, um, you know, he takes care of his own, right? And so I believe that just having a pure heart and, and staying sincere, staying in the word of God, it will keep us to that place where we're constantly self-reflecting and we're uh, examining ourselves on a daily basis, right? And I know as for me, I want to stay in love. I want to keep a heart of flesh and never develop a heart of stone, right? And so I'm just going to share from my reading this morning. First Corinthians chapter 13, you that have your Bibles, let's read the chapter this morning and just read, feed our spirits with this, right? I'm sipping on some hot ginger and honey tea. It's very good for the digestive system in the morning and it energizes the body as well. Uh, so first Corinthians chapter 13, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And I want to comment on that. This is Paul speaking, right? And so we see a lot of random language being spewed out in today's time, which is classified as tongues which is classified as functions of the holy spirit right and we have to be careful also with uh receiving a lot of things in our ear gates that we are not sure (laughs) if this is of god or not god is not the author of confusion evil is also very real right And you know that there are a lot of people who put curses on folks through uttering certain languages that these people could not even understand through their lack of knowledge, right? People have been destroyed, have perished prematurely because of their lack of knowledge. And what Paul is saying here, even if he can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, right? Meaning the language that is given by the Holy Spirit and his natural language of man tongue is just mean language right if he have if he doesn't have love in his heart he's just become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal meaning that means nothing right so speaking in tongue is not evidence in today's time and this is my two cents and what i'm saying is not evidence of anyone having the holy spirit and that is not the greatest gift goes back to what I've always said in the beginning, test love. And that does not something that you could just look at a person and say, oh, this person have love in his heart. I mean, you can look at a series of things a person does over a period of time. And then you can realize this is love because none of us is perfect. Because someone that you may see today doing something loving or making you feel good in a certain way could disappoint you tomorrow. Or that could be a sensitive subject or a sensitive topic that comes about 
and you may disagree with that individual on, are you going to say that's a hateful individual now because we don't see eye to eye? Because none of us will always agree on everything, right? And so it takes time over a period of time, consistent actions of an individual reveal what's in our heart. It reveals who we truly are. Do I live a life of tearing other people down? Do I live a life of trying to esteem myself? Do I live a life of manipulating people in their ignorance or manipulating people's pain so that I can capitalize off of them and build myself up in a way and use the name of God to lift myself up or make people feel like they are, there's a bunch of error on the inside of them. And I am the only mouthpiece of God to teach you this way so that you can listen to me or, or because I am the only one who has a degree, you should be listening to me and anybody who does not have a degree, you should not be listening to them. And am I that type of narcissistic individual that will try to esteem myself and get the glory and get the honor because I want self elevation. Do I live a life like that? I'm just giving these examples or do I live a life of, because I'm the one who's married, you can only take marriage advice from me or you should not ever take any type of advice relationship from anybody else because nobody has a mind that can tell you how the human brain thinks or how the human brain should function in a relationship if they are not in a relationship, right? And so we just need to examine ourselves, all of us, or you should never take advice from anyone over here who doesn't have make as much money or who doesn't make this amount of money a year, they cannot give you any type of advice about money or about anything, you know? And I'm just throwing these random examples out there. What are, what is our intention? What are our, what is our purpose? Is it for self elevation? Are we doing what we're doing from the kindness of our heart for love, shining our light into the earth? Or do we really just want self elevation? elevation do we really just want to um esteem ourselves better than others or do we really just want the praises of men or are we just genuinely living a life of humility and integrity and, and love and we can honor others and love others in spite of their brokenness in spite of their imperfections right because we all have things about us that are imperfected in certain areas, right? Hope that makes sense. Let's go to verse two. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all, and how did I branch off into all of that when Paul was just simply talking about speaking in tongues and having love? But anyway, as though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all belief so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. So he's comparing it again. You know, I can have, I can move mountains because of my faith, right? Because I can be a strong believer and have faith. But if I ain't got love, if I ain't got love, I still don't have nothing. I got faith. I can believe things will come to pass. I can stand on the word of God. But I, I'm, I'm all about selfish ambition. There's no love. There's no empathy. There's no compassion. There's no grace and mercy for my brothers and sisters. I have nothing. I have nothing. Right? No love. And though I bestow, verse 3, all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing, right? Because we can give to the poor. We can say that we are, we are giving to these um, charity organizations, but are we giving out of our abundance? Or are we giving because we generally have love in our heart, right? Some folk give out of their abundance and they get a tax write-off at the end of the year and it benefits them. God judges the heart only we know what our true motives are, right? Is it really done out of love? Am I really impacting individual lives or am I just doing something or giving in a way that I can still reciprocate or that benefits me on the back end, right? 
Remember the lady that gave her last? She gave a penny. And what did the Lord say? She gave the most. Why? Not only did she give from, from her heart, but she gave from her uh, lack. She gave the last that she had while everyone else was just coming and dropping. They dropped them more than her, but it didn't even phase them. See, it didn't really, it just, it just was out of their abundance. So it doesn't, nothing really touched their heart. And Jesus knew that. And he said, she gave the most. See, um, verse four, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love does not vaunt itself, is not puffed up does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily, meaning not self-seeking, right? Always seeking to think about other people, always putting people before yourself, always trying to encourage somebody else. Sometimes when you need encouragement for yourself, always think about how can you give, how can you help people, how can you be make an impact on somebody who really needs help? Always putting others first. God takes account of that. When you're self-seeking, you're always thinking about how can I draw people to me to benefit me? How can I benefit off of them? How can they be of a of a use to me? How can I get into these people's minds so that they will, um, I have to find a way to pitch it to them so that they can come and sign up for my academy, so they can sign up for my school. But I have to get into their mind so they can understand that they are lacking something or they're of a certain mindset, I have to figure out how I can manipulate them to come and and buy this thing or do this thing so that I can fill my pockets up and I can look out and take care of my family. So let me tell them that, hey, you need to get out of the mindset that you're in and then you can come over here versus just, hey, this is something I've created. If you want to indulge in it, you can indulge in it. I took my time and put it together. I think it'll benefit you. If you want to buy this, if you want to buy my course, if you want to um, see what it's about, then if you want to support me, support me. But there's no manipulation with it, see? But when there's manipulation with it, oh, I got to make you think that there's a problem with the way you are, with the way you're thinking. I got to beat your spirit down a little bit and then tell you, come on over here. I got a solution. Come and buy my course. Come and sign up for my school so that, you know, I can you can change your mindset. That's not love. That is not love. And see, when we sit back and we examine ourselves, oftentimes we can deflect sometimes because we can point out the flaws and the issues in our brothers and sisters that we ourselves are not guilty of. But there is something on the inside of us that we are guilty of because we are all flawed. We are all imperfect human beings. Now, if you may be a perfect person, then you shouldn't be listening to this video, right? And if you are a perfect person, give yourself a pat on the back. You're, you're signed, sealed, delivered. Your name is already written in heaven. You shouldn't even be communicating. You should hide yourself from the public, from people. People shouldn't even be seeing your face if you are a perfect person, because you are already, your name is written in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. So you should just go somewhere and bury yourself and wait until God takes you up because you are perfect already. And you don't want us who are imperfect. You don't need to be contaminated by us, right? That's in my little two cents, right? But it's the motive. It's the motive, right? What are we doing in our hearts, right? Because I can say that, okay, I'm not a fornicator. I live a consecrated life. I'm fully surrendered to God. And so therefore, if I learn of someone who's a fornicator, now I'm going to really teach you on fornication, even because I know that I'm not guilty of that. But have I been guilty of that before? Yes, I have. Right. But no one sat and no one came in and, and, and exposed my fornication. No one came in and dug deep into me about it. It's just the point where I reached a point where, you know, I fully surrendered to God and I was able to, you know, transition in that path without any type of scrutiny or anything like that. But because I have now been consecrated and I know that I live a, a surrendered life to God, I am going to point out those who are still in fornication and I'm going to talk about fornication and I'm going to call your name and I'm going to point you out, right? Because you need to change. You need to stop living in sin and willful sin. I am a hypocrite. If I do that, that makes me a hypocrite. 
And not only that, that exposes that there is something on the inside of me that still needs to be tweaked. There may be something else that I want, that I am hiding. And do you also know sometimes people can go so hard and point out a certain sin and it's because they also struggle with that thing? And it could be shocking because you would think that they're so, you know, they're so holy and, and they're doing good. But I remember one time this lady, I never forget this, as I was in my career, right? I will work on this lady. She, we had a mutual friend and sometimes we'd go uh, take lunch breaks. We'd take lunch breaks together or, um, you know, we'd see each other out or we'd end up going to exercise or something like that. And this particular individual, she would always point out um, the fact that, you know, she can't stand being around um, people who are gay. She would say these things and she would say, oh, I can't stand that. That's a gay spirit. Or, you know, and if a, and a and if an employee or somebody got hired, she would always try to treat them like, oh, I, I don't want to be around. I don't want to touch the pen that he using. You know, she I remember she treated this one individual so bad that he went he had to go to the supervisor and she got, um, you know, rep, you know, reprimanded for her character. The things that she would do, it would just be so blatantly obvious. It's not like nobody was bothering her. It's not like nobody was putting it in their face, trying to force people to accept it like some places do now, you know, and some of the laws that some of these people have passed where they are forcing things in certain people faces. But it was just like an individual would be around or come to work, got get hired. And if you could tell that, you know, they were in that lifestyle, she would be so, she would make, like say things blatantly, make it obvious that, you know, she's against this type of lifestyle when really people were just coming to work to do their jobs, right? I saw it as being unprofessional. And sometimes when we would be at lunch and stuff, she would always say, that can't, that, that's a nasty spirit. And she would always bring this thing up. I mean, it was consistent. And sometimes I would reflect on that. And I would say, Dad, why is she always saying stuff? Like you could be talking about how beautiful a day it is. You're enjoying lunch or something like that. She would make it her business. Not one time that I crossed this individual path and she would not make it her business to say this thing well lo and behold after some time it was some years later i learned that this individual was had had a the one of the friends that she had they were secretly involved in that lifestyle and it was she was keeping it that thing hidden and i said to myself how hypocritical is that to go so hard against people speak about it so much and he go this is something that you yourself are struggling with, you know? And so that's what I say. Sometimes you have to get to the motive of why people are doing and saying what they're doing. And when somebody is so hard at pointing out the issues, the errors, the flaws directly in their brothers and sisters and just murdering them while they're still alive, you know, beating them down because they may have learned error and they're not washing them with the word of God. They're not trying to use the word of God, you know, to just uh, put the word of God out there. Because as long, if you really are surrendered to God and you're standing 10 toes down on the word and you're living a life for Christ, you know, as you grow, that old no good dirty serpent that is our adversary, he is going to constantly roam to and from seeking whom he may devour and one day he may catch you when you're weak one day he may catch you when you're at a when you have a broken heart when you may have had tragedy in your family when you may have experienced financial setback when you may you don't know how none of us know how we are going to leave this earth none of us know what is going to transpire in the days while we are in this earth None of us know these things. And if there's somebody that know everything, like I said, then they need to be consecrated and shut, set apart because they don't need for us little people who are imperfect to contaminate them. But you never know how that adversary will get you caught up. You never know how his tactic will come because he constantly strategizes. And you got to stay in the word. You have to constantly feed yourself with the word. And you can't be playing because, oh, baby, he'll chew you up and spit you out if he can get a 
crack if he can get a foothold. And so as you know, as you're growing and God is consistently developing us and maturing us, there's some things he shave off of us and we all at different levels and we keep growing and we keep growing. But we must ask ourselves, am I being do, am I doing this for selfish ambition? Am I doing this for monetary gain because I need the money? Am I being manipulated? Because you will run out of gas soon. If you ain't running on the strength of God and if God ain't with you, because God, if God is with you in spite of our imperfections, no demon in hell is going to be able to destroy you. But if God is not with you and you know you're being manipulative, one day you're going to run out of gas. One day, all the things that you do against your brothers and sisters for selfish elevation, selfish ambition, it's going to backfire. And it's going to be a sad time for you. And this ain't something I'm talking, I reckon. These are things that I've seen happen over the course of my life, time after time. I've seen people, things backfire on people, right? I've never tried to live this life as a perfect individual. I strive for it every day. And one thing I know, I love God. And I know how to recognize the spirit of my father. And you can recognize when folk have the love of God in them. Because you can tell how they have integrity and how they treat other people and how they can, the things that they consistently do over a course, a period of time, in spite of their imperfections. You can tell when folk have the love of God in them. There are certain things you're just not going to do. Right? And so anyway, let me get back to this so I can finish because I got to hurry up and get off of here. Um, so I stopped at... Um, verse five, right? Does not look, we're talking about love does not behave itself unseemly seeks, not, not her own is not easily provoked. Thinks no evil rejoices, not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Oh, it says believes all things, having faith endures all things love is also you know we go through long suffering you know because of the conditions of our heart as well right but we shall see the goodness of the lord in the land of the living it's not in vain to keep a pure heart sometimes it's a struggle to keep a, a pure heart right because of all the opposition that comes at you sometimes right it makes you Sometimes sit back and what the enemy would want to make us do is get do eye for eye. But we know that that's not of the father. We have to keep a pure heart and take the high road, which is us trusting God and allowing him to fight our battles for us. Right. And he fights a battle in a way that is better than what the carnal mind could do, because we'll get ourselves in trouble. We'll fall into sin. We'll do things that are not of God, which causes our heart to be contaminated. But when we trust him sometimes, all the time we should trust him, but when we trust him and we see him working for us, it's amazing. And it makes you want to trust him even more. Hold your peace sometimes. If I hold my peace, let the Lord fight my battles. Victory, victory shall be mine and sometimes that can be the most difficult thing for us to do is holding that tongue especially if you're a person who always try to you know get things to right you want things to be right you just well if we could just have this conversation if we could just talk about it well if we could just come to this understanding or if we could just change this then we could be on one accord or if this could happen you know you try to fix things all the time gotta give it to god that's relinquishing control sometimes you know we cannot control everything right and that's a part of stepping out of the flesh as well the flesh likes to control but when we give everything to god we trust him we have to sit back and just you know stay on our little thin path and realize that you know accept the things that are out of our control knowing that god is in total control right and it allows peace to reside in our lives. You don't have to engage every argument. You don't have to give your energy to every disingenuous spirit. You don't have to answer every question that is asked of you when you know that it's not coming from a sincere place, right? Hold your peace sometimes and just pray. 
and move on. Keep on moving. Don't try to reason with people that you know the spirit of righteousness is not even on the inside of them. Hold your peace and keep on moving. Right? Stay in love. Keep a pure heart. Verse 7. Uh, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8. Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Right? But love never fails, and it's never going to vanish away. Why? What is it? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever shall believe in him. And only begotten son, we know that we're all sons and daughters. Somebody said, oh, why is he saying his only begotten son that we're all his sons and daughters? That's the one that he implanted in the earth into uh, uh, um, into the earth spiritually, right? So that's why we say that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Love is the DNA of the father. So love will never perish. God loves us, right? Verse nine, for we know in part and we shall prophesy in part. And all it means when it says prophesy, it doesn't mean all this, God has shown me this person is evil. God has shown me this person is this. No, it just means teach. Prophesy in part, we know in part. The flesh blocks us from knowing in full because you know we know that we came from above, but we don't fully know everything unless he constantly reveals it to us. Like he actually took Enoch back up and he allowed Enoch to see the different levels of heaven. He allowed Enoch to be taught by the angels and he allowed Enoch to come back down and teach and write and leave stories for us in the earth today, right? And so we know that we came from above. We know that life is spiritual. We know that this flesh has to go back to the earth from whence it came. And it cannot go to that other world where the spirit will continue to live. And so some things we we, we teach in part, like sometimes you hear people say download, God will download something in our spirit. You know how things come in your spirit and you just can't shake it or you be like, well, is this me or is this my human self or is this a spirit? You're not sure sometimes so you say, okay, well, I'm going to just leave it there. And if it's you, God, you'll bring it back to me the next day or, or the next day comes and it's coming back to your spirit. You'll be like, well, is this, you still question yourself because you don't want to get ahead of God. So you say, well, if this is really you, God, I'm going to wait until next week. And then if this is really you, I need clarity. So I, it won't be me. It'll be you. And then you wait until next week and that thing comes back to you. You know, it's like he downloads things in us. And it's, it, it, Moses asked for, um, asked for clarity, right? And so that's being, that's part of being humble as well. Not trying to be God, not getting ahead of God. That's just like, sometimes we can dream a dream. And then you have some people say, I noticed one person, um, this individual wears the title of a pastor and he is not being led by the spirit of God. And I know many times he'll, he's had dreams over the years. He'll say, God told me it was going to be like this. And God told me this and God told me this and he's lied on God and God didn't tell him that. And so the thing that he said, God told him when it didn't happen like that, he said, well, I know, I know what God told me. They could have been like this. He, he keeps changing it up. And it's like, he wants to be God. You know, that's somebody who doesn't have the love of God, who's gone out, but God did not send them, right? And so they can lead the people away who don't have eyes to see and ears to hear, who don't study for themselves, who don't really have a personal relationship with God. God, they lead the gullible away. And you have a lot of that going on now. And these people become very dangerous as they constantly build themselves up to be very influential. They're building themselves up by the momentum that the enemy is giving them. And so when they build themselves up in a demonic way, they become very dangerous to those who are fully surrendered and humbled to Christ because now what their enemy will use them to do is to throw stumbling blocks into those who are shining a pure and sincere light. And they throw stumbling blocks into the paths of the children of light in order to make you fall back, be quiet, shut your mouth, hide your light. Why? Because as your light keeps shining, it's going to automatically uncover the error within them, even though you may not even know of them, even though you may not be even looking in their direction, they are afraid of that light. And it's not really them. It's the darkness that they have become possessed by because they chose to do it their way. They started out at a foundation where they may have sincerely wanted to know God eventually, but when they saw they started building up momentum, then their pride crept in. 
You know, they failed that test because that spirit of pride connected to their spirit. Envy creeps in, jealousy creeps in, competition creeps in, and they keep going and they keep going and they keep going. And then not only that, the enemy will give them money. And so now the more money the enemy gives them, you think that they're going to stop and say, you know what? I need to self-reflect. Um, I got to stop. I got to sit down. I got to be quiet. I got to be discipled. I got to, you know, I, I need, I need help. You know, they're not going to stop. You know, and so they, their true nature is revealed. It's like, okay, so are you a tear or are you a wheat? You know, and just because somebody has built themselves up to be very influential, to build up church, to have people listening to them, does that mean that that is the spirit of the Lord? And going back to speaking in tongues, if they gibber a, a language, is that what is capturing the people? Because there's a lot of blind sheep being led astray. If they're speaking in what the people can't understand, an unknown language, and they're calling it a tongue, is that truly evidence? We know what the scripture says, but see, they take that scripture, and that's what confuses a lot of people who don't have eyes to see, who can't discern the spirit behind that. So it sounds like, well, they got a church. They got a lot of people listening to them. They're saying these languages in tongues. They're speaking in tongues. So the Holy Spirit must be with them. No, that's how a lot of people have been led astray. That's how a lot of people have been taken captive, right? It's bewitchment of the mind. But when you know God for yourself and you can study his word and you build a genuine or personal relationship with him, it's very hard for the enemy to trick you. It's very hard for the wolves in sheep clothing to creep in and, 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 and make you submit to them and follow them. And oftentimes when they can't manipulate you, you become a target because again, your light is a threat to that kingdom of darkness that they have built up, that kingdom of falsehood. And it can be a very large influential kingdom, but it is of darkness, right? And so you have attacks coming from you from that angle at a certain point, but you got to keep on going. He that endures to the end, right? This is all a battle. It's all a battle because oftentimes your light and your walk and your own life is going to open the eyes of other people, right? It's going to shine a light in darkness. It's going to help people see, wow, coming to God, God is simple. You know, it's not difficult. It's not a secret. It's not a magic trick. You don't have to jump through hoops to know God. It's simple. Come, all ye who are heavy laden and burdened, he will give you rest. Knowing God is simple, just picking up the word for yourself. You know, you don't have to know all of this secret knowledge and stuff it's right here study to show thyself approved faithfully rightfully dividing the word of god is simple god is simple when you're weak ask for strength speak life over yourself let the weak say i am strong let the poor say i am rich walk by faith and not by sight god will bless your his children right you don't have to chase behind a man or a woman to be blessed by God, right? And, and over time, you learn your tribe. There are tribes of darkness. There are tribes of light, <laughs> you know, right? And so, you know, broad is their way to the, to Sheol. Narrow, narrow is that path to the kingdom of heaven, right? So anyway, let's finish up this. But when verse 10 Verse nine said, we know in part, we prophesy in part, meaning we teach, we edify in part. And verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with, right? Because there will be no blockage, right? We will now be able to see in full, right? When, when that which is perfect is come, right? Verse 11, which is our savior, Yeshua. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, right? Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known, right? I only know what I can see partially i see through a glass darkly right i can see partially right but 
face to face. I know in right now, I know in part, but then when we are face to face, when that which is perfect come, I shall also know as I am known because he knows me. I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. And so therefore, like, like, for example, let's go back to what Job told God when, when Job was on his bed of affliction, right? When the enemy, when all his so-called friends, all the religious leaders, they kept telling him, repent, you know, you did something wrong. And it was trusting this man out because the, the, the beginning of the book of Job sets the tone. It says, Job was a perfect man, upright in all of his ways. He was pleasing to God. So that sets, that lets us know his heart. And that lets us set the tone where he was approved by God. God was pleased with him. So what he went through, what he went through because God allowed it. So the God we serve today, he's still in control of everything. The enemy cannot do anything without the permission of God. Right. And so he allowed Joe to be tested. And that goes to show you, he will allow us to be tested. He pulls his presence away from us at times. Right. So that our true nature can be tested. Because sometimes you can just hear God. You know that this is God. You know that this is God comforting your spirit. You can feel his presence. Then there are times when you don't always feel the presence of God. And you don't know if God, God, can you hear me? God, are you telling me to do this? You feel, you you know, it's like you're, you're on your own. Like the, like the training wheels off of your bicycle as a kid, they're off. And now you got to pedal this thing. But you know when them training wheels are there, you got some safety. So if you want to get a little lazy, if you want to stop in the middle of nowhere, you got something holding you up. But then there are times when those training wheels come off and now you are tested, right? Because our faith must be tried by fire. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So going back to what I was saying by Job, when uh, uh, what this reminds me of when Paul is saying, I know now, now I know in part, but then I, you know, um, when um, I shall, I shall know face to face for when that, you know, like right now I see in part through a glass, I see through a glass, but it's darkly, you know, meaning I can only see partially, but when the one is perfect come, we'll be known. We'll be able to see, you know, in full, I'll be able to be known just as I am known. Right. Because God knew us before we were in our mother's womb. Right. And so, um, going back to how I related what came to my spirit just now about Job is when Job, when, when God, when Job was on that bed of affliction, after all the counsel of his friend, after his wife even let the devil jump in her, tell her to curse God and die, he never gave up on his faith. He never cursed God. He complained about himself. But when God finally showed up and he questioned Job and he pretty much told Job to man up, you know, all the things that he was saying to Job, he was showing how powerful he really was. Like I, you know, letting Job know I'm all powerful, you know? And so after God finished talking, Job was like, you know, I don't really know what to say, but one thing that stuck with me, he said, you know, he, he apologized to God. He asked God, he, you know, forgive me. He's like, I only know what I have heard of you. See, but now you've shown up. Like I've been serving you all this time from, from not even seeing you with my own eyes, not even having a personal contact with you. I've only served you and I've been faithful to you off of what I've heard and been taught about you. Pretty much that's what Job was saying. But now I know you for myself. I see you for myself. You see what I'm saying? So now he's knowing just how powerful and big and real God is. He knows in full now. See, beforehand, when he was serving and sacrificing for his kid and living his life, he was living a pure life upright, but he still only knew in part. See, he never had a personal encounter with God. Until after the enemy was allowed to test his faith and Satan was allowed to do that. And he tried to hit him in the worst way, the worst way. But Joe still didn't lose his faith. He didn't curse God and say, well, God, if you so real, you're fake. If you real, why you got me on this bed of affliction? Why I got to suffer like this? I don't believe in you. They can't, you can't be real. He said, I cursed the day I came out of my mother's womb, you know, but he never cursed God. And so that speaks volume. And I believe that that's why God put his friends to shame. All of those religious leaders who had the titles and they spoke so eloquently, they were going back and forth with this man, but they didn't know spiritual warfare. They didn't know spiritual warfare. They said a lot of great things, but at the same time, they grieved Joe's spirit. They, they stressed him out while he was already down. I don't want friends like that. I want iron sharpers. I want people who, um, you know, can see spiritually and understand the word of God, you know, but I don't want hypocritical hypocrites 
around me like that. Hypocritical friends, they, if they have a form of godliness, but they didn't even know the power of God. And they didn't even know how to recognize spiritual attack. They kept telling Job, well, he, you know, surely he did something wrong. Each and every one of them took a dig at Job. And that is why God put them to shame. They had the titles, but Job had the pureness of heart. See, and God knew that, but he still allowed Job to be tested. He allowed that to be tested. And so many of you, you're being tested. And you're going to come out victorious and you're going to come out with great substance and more than what you had before, right? Our faith must be tried by fire and without faith, it's impossible to please God. How can he prove us if he does not allow our faith to be tested? And it's not easy sometimes when your faith is tested because you have a lot coming at you and it's painful. It can be painful sometimes. It can break us or make us, right? But God won't put no more on us than we can bear. Sometimes you may feel like you're going to lose it, but you keep pressing through. You're coming out victorious. And as, the, as your faith been tried and you come out on that other side, you're going to be so strong and, and shiny like a brass. People might not like you, but they ain't going to be able to deny that strength and that power working you is nothing but God. You're going to be real strong, real resilient. You see? And so God put them religious folk to shame. He put Job's friend to shame to show them that he honored Job more than them. He used the foolish thing to confound the wise. See, they thought they were so wise and they standing over Job while he on the bed of affliction. Not one of them said, Job, let me lay hand on you. The enemy has come against you. We bind and rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. We break every curse, Father, in the name of Jesus. We, we recognize that this is Satan. We recognize that this is the enemy coming against Job to break his faith that has come to rob and take everything from him, Father. We ask that you take the permission away from Satan. Let this come to an end and let Job be restored after this day, God, because of his faith, because he believes in you. It's unwavering, God. You who have created this body, we cover Job from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, God. Let restoration begin to take place. And even I think if Job would have come through, but he didn't understand it. He didn't know, you know. And so he was tested. And, um, and that had to happen to get the fear out of him, you know. Because he always feared losing those things. And so knowing how big God is, as long as you trust him, he provides. He gives and he takes away. But he put those religious leaders to shame. And he said, I won't hear from you unless my servant Job prays for you. So he closed his ears to them. And now they had to rely on Job to send up a prayer and petition on their behalf. See, Job was more righteous. God was more pleased with Job than he was with them. And they were over Job the whole time, telling him to repent, telling him he did something. He must have done something wrong to come under all of that. Even the devil jumped into his wife. So imagine how alone and how isolated he felt going through that trial, broken, down, lost everything, heartbroken. The enemy wanted to destroy him. You done lost all your possessions, all your children, all your cattle, all your animals. Now he coming for your health and your strength. Now you on a bed of affliction. You got to rely on somebody to come and take care of you. And the people who you thought were friends, all they doing is coming around you grieving your spirit. The, the person that you married to, she done let the devil jump in the hut to tell you, just go ahead and curse God and die. No love for you. No support. Now all you got is to stay there. You cursed the day you was born. You wish you was never born, but you ain't cursing God. See, the test with Satan was the only reason Job honored you is because you didn't give him everything. You didn't build that wedge of protection around him. Let me have a, a lick at him, and I bet you he'll curse you to your face and die. See, that was Satan tell God so he could get at Job, and God allowed that thing to be tested, right? But God already knew what he was going to do on the other side as well. He allowed Job's faith to be tested. And even though Satan did what he did, 
and proved that he removed the hedge of protection. He, he, he proved that he was able to penetrate and take all the things away that God gave Job. Job still did not curse God to his face and die. And that's what the enemy really wanted. See? And now, you know, the thing Job greatly feared, which came upon him, he feared losing his children. He feared losing all of those things. That fear is out of him now. God don't give us a spirit of fear. Fear comes from the devil. God give us a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. Where there is fear, there is doubt. Where there is fear, there is no faith. You cannot, we cannot operate in faith and abide in fear at all. We can't get stuff accomplished. Me being a single woman, you know, never married, never having children, no siblings, no brothers or sisters. The, the, the business that I run now, the things that it requires, it requires a lot of physical strength. It requires me sometimes to work on my own equipment. I couldn't do different things and repair certain things if I had fear. When I told some of my friends and my elders that I pulled the transmission out of my Ram 3500 and put a new one in, they couldn't believe it. That, that transmission is well over five, 600 pounds. It's heavy. They couldn't believe it. If I had fear, I couldn't do that. Living this life as a single woman, you go through so much opposition, especially a strong black woman. You go through so much. People label you as confrontational. They label you as, oh, you you know, then you get you get opposition from your own people. You get opposition from sisters that don't have the same strength as you. Oh, you doing that stuff. You shouldn't be doing that. Why you can't never come out with us and, and go and get your nails done? Why you can't never hang with us? You get opposition from men who are intimidated by you. Oh, well, you being the man, you don't need no man then. See, and they being feminine, in a feminine injury, don't even know how to turn a wrench, don't believe in getting their hands dirty. Never say, you know what? That woman right there is a strong woman. I never see a man coming in and out of her house. I see her out there working in the yard. I see her out there taking care of her chickens. I see her out there planting in a garden. I see her going to work, coming home. Never see nobody, never see that woman corn around in the street. Never hear that woman name up and down the streets. Using what she got to get what she want. I seen that woman work hard. I seen that woman when I come in contact with her, she always giving God the glory. Always talking about God. Doing what she got to do to survive. You see? You get all type of opposition and you got to press through all of that. Being a true man or woman of God. And if you keeping yourself, you will get people that talk about you. Oh, you ain't, I ain't never seen you out there dating no men. I ain't never seen you out there you know, who you, who you going with now? You, you, you gay, you like men, you like, do you really like men? If you keeping yourself, that's the challenge of the enemy to make you get out here and start proving yourself and you weak minded because now you're going to fornicate just so somebody will not think that you are a certain way. That's weakness. That's not strength. I heard, uh, uh, I heard Kirk Franklin say this, you know, growing up as a boy, you know, when people call you gay you go and sleep with a lot of girls so that people won't think that you're gay that's not strength you know my massage therapist he was sharing with me he said you know i wish growing up as a boy we had more men that and and, and he said because even the women would tell us that sometimes you know women older women would make you think that you're not man man enough if you're not out here you know being with other women and so you know he said he lost his virginity to an older woman older woman he said i wish i had somebody uh um Growing up, I wish there were more support growing up to tell you, no, that's that's weak minded to go out here and hoe around and, 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 and be with so many different people just so people can perceive you in a certain way. That's weakness. That's not strength. See, it takes strength to live upright. It takes strength to walk in integrity. It takes strength to maintain a level of righteousness and holiness about yourself. Why? Because the world will label you. The world will try to tear you apart because you don't look like them, because you don't walk like them, because they can't figure you out. They want a box to put you in. They want to be able to classify you and move on to the next person. It takes strength to be your own. And in spite of your imperfections, sometimes you're going to have imperfections. We all do. You're going to make mistakes in life sometimes. But it takes strength to get back up and keep walking in your own lanes, in your own shoes, you know, creating your own identity and standing on it and being you, right? It takes strength to do all of that. 
And so anyway, um, you know, and my massage therapist, he talks about these things a lot. He's very educated, um, you know, he's very wise. He has a daughter and he always would tell me, I want my daughter to be like you. I've had several guys tell me that, you know, and I think it's because men are very protective of their daughters. Uh, some men, you know, those who were there in their daughter's lives, they're very protective and they understand the mind of other, some other men. And so they want their daughters to be guarded and, you know, not easily give themselves over to anyone who's not worthy. Right. Um, but anyway, I don't know how I jump into all of that talking about Job and stuff like that. I don't know how I got into all of that. Uh, where was I? Um, but yeah, God put Job's enemies to shame. And I didn't mean to make this video so long, but, um, you know, um, I don't even know how I got on Job. Oh, I think I, yeah, I got on Job by saying, by what Paul was saying, for we know in part, right? And so Job only knew what he had heard of God. And so I already said all of that. So let me just finish this up right quick. Um, right. And so, um, um. Another thing I want to say, when Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. He's talking about the level of maturity when we're coming into these things as far as serving God and, and, and you know, and understanding the word of God and understanding who God really is, right? Um, and so when I became a man, I put childish ways away, childish thinking away. Um, but I also want to go back to the fact, because I also said, I also like to say and remind us to stay in a childlike nature meaning walk in humility and going back to what Jesus said when he told the people, he called them over to the disciples and he pointed at the little child and said, unless you become like this little child, you know, you should not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Right. And it just goes for walking in a place of humility, staying humble, keeping that humble childlike nature towards our father and in this life period. Right. But as we grow in Christ and as we grow up, we understand and become mature in the word of God. And we know how to, um, apply the scriptures with grace, with love, you know, and not with condemning people and closing the kingdom of heaven on our brothers and sisters, because we are all flawed human being. We all are. Even if I learn, even if you come, the Bible says we're supposed to confess our sins to one another, but that's not easy to do in this day and time because you got a lot of hypocrites for clout who don't have love in their heart and they want self-elevation. They're secretly competing. They want the praises of men. And some people are doing things because they want to make, they need talking points to make more money, which is selling their souls. They don't look at it as that, but it is, you know, and they become a slave to the way that they sell their souls. But um, it's not love when we operate in those, in those ways. When we become mature in Christ, um, we learn how to apply the word of God from a place of grace and edification, um, which doesn't condemn anyone to heaven or hell you know, to, you know, we don't have a place to put anyone in heaven or put anyone in hell. Only God can do that, but we can shine our own light and just live our lives authentically. And I believe when you show up for life authentically and live in pureness of love and joy and just shine your light, you will have the peace of God in your life. You will sleep good at night. The Bible says there's no rest for the wicked. So when we see people do things against their brothers and sisters and they're constantly tearing down other people. They're constantly as if they're the Jesus patrol, the kingdom of heaven patrol to say who is going to heaven, who is going to hell, who's right, who's wrong. And people giving out all these prophecies about other people. That's not how the spirit of the Lord works. It's not how the spirit of the Lord works at all. You know, and when people are so drawn to these prophecies, you got to ask yourself, why are you so drawn to somebody who's always giving out a prophetic word versus just living their life, showing you the life that they live? Because that's not letting your light shine. Letting your light shine is letting what's inside of you shine. What are you doing every day? What are your skills? What are your gifts? What are you, how are you living your life? <laughs> you know, are you saying that you're letting your light shine just by showing up every day? giving out a prophecy of what God has told you about somebody else. No, that's modern day gossip hidden behind, um, you know, that's, 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 that's hitting behind masking that spirit of gossip and manipulation and messiness behind God. That is not God, you know, and it's just my little two cents, right? Take it or leave it. It ain't worth a nickel or a dime, but let's go ahead and finish this. So I don't make this video no longer. Um, uh, where was I, where did I finish this thing? Um, oh, verse 13, I was on the last one. And um, verse 13 says, and now abides belief, which is faith, 
hope, love, these three. So faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love is the greatest gift of all, right? And so that was my word this morning, stay in love, right? And um, I want all of us, we could check our motives. At what I'm doing, is it coming? What is the motive behind what I am doing? Is it coming from a place of love, right? And we all know whether we're doing the right thing or not. We all know whether we're really being loving or we're being messy or we're being envious or manipulative or greedy or something like that, right? So let's just check ourselves. And so that's all I wanted to share. Y'all have a blessed day. If nobody has told you that they love you today, then you already know your little country bunking sister loves you. We are the light of the world. Let's don't never let our lights go dark, baby. Let's keep shining bright. And we know that the blood of Jesus is the only blood that has some powers. I got to get out here. The temperature is changing outside. And um, and so it's cold now. The mornings are cold, which is a good thing for me. I mean, I mean, I don't really like moving around in the cool, but it's a good thing where it's not so hot in the morning. So I, I don't have to like rush outside before the heat comes. I can kind of take my time, but I got to get out here. All of my vehicles, I am going to pull out my air compressor and upgrade the air because, you know, once that temperature begins to change, we lose pounds of pressure in our tires um and so i'm going to go out and air up all of my tires um on all of my vehicles that's what i'm going to do i've already um stocked got my chicken coops and stuff stocked up yesterday with I, not really stocked up i gave them some fruits and stuff so i'll probably uh stock them up with feed a little later so I will have to do that, and then I'm going to go and rake some leaves in my backyard a bit um, so that I can start getting a handle on that. I did not get a handle on it last year when all the leaves were falling. I had I kept saying I was going to even build a I got that little plastic garage shed I had in the back. I said I was going to tear that down and build another one because that is starting to deteriorate. Um, but I've taken all of my stuff out, most of my things out of there, and moved it into the other shed that I built. But I didn't even have time to get to that because work – load and I thank God I'm not complaining um my workload God has really been good to me you know with my business he's just I've been getting bookings I've been overbooked and so that kept me busy last year where I um, didn't get a chance to tear my shed down and then this year I didn't really get a chance and I didn't even keep up with the leaves that were falling last fall so I have old leaves out there and new leaves are starting to fall and this year I am determined to at least clean my grounds get the leaves up um, and not let them keep piling up because as it rains, it my yard is kind of slanted, which is a good thing. I don't hold water in where I am located, but it goes all the way to the lowest parts of my yard, which is one of my largest chicken coops. And I notice when I go to open the door, it's all like the dirt is piled up. So I have to shovel it out sometimes and build it up. I say I'm going to put bricks on it and take it up one level higher. But um, that's where everything flows, all the debris, all the old leaves. When it when we get rain, everything washes down to the lower part of my yard. But um, anyway, let me get off of here. Y'all have a blessed day, and I hope you, um, you know, I hope your day is just filled with love, joy, and peace. And just remember, stay in love. It's easy to stay in love. It takes focus to be mean, to be cruel. Um, to try to pull somebody else down because you actually have to study other people and watch other people's lives in order to try to pull them down. And that's taking time from your own life when you could we could be productive in our own lives and accomplishing something. And, you know, and it also, after we do those things, it also leads us back to a place of misery if we do those things because that, that, that that's not, those don't come from a, from a place of love and joy. You know, um, it comes from a place of insecurity and maybe some deeply rooted trauma that's still unhealed and seeing somebody else's light or somebody else's strength, it makes you feel inadequate in a certain area of your life. And because you don't have the skills to maybe reach out to that brother or sister and maybe say, Hey, I see that you're strong in this area and I want to learn from you in this way, or, um, just, and, you know, embrace them or just give them credit for their strength you try to tear them down for that strength because you feel some type of way. That's not love and that's not God. And we got to normalize putting a stop to that as those type of behaviors as well. And I think we will see a lot of the dysfunction and the chaos that has been entered into the body of Christ. We close the door on it when we stop entertaining people who do these things and have this messiness in their spirit and spend time causing so much 
confusion is pouring out so much evil and hatred into the world. It actually pulls the spirit down. And me personally, I can't get my ears to that stuff. I like, I, I have to stay focused, you know, so that I can feel good and joy makes you feel good. It's just, it's strength, right? Have a blessed day.